This is the basketball show. What they gonna say next? Hello, great to have you with us for another episode of The Basketball Show brought to you by TCL Mobile, 2K and News Corp. I'm Joe Healy alongside the great man Shane Heal. Hammer, how are you the doing? great man. Oh, I like that. Thank you. You're Thank very you. welcome. Thank you. very often. Um, <laughs> for quick. obvious reasons. <laughs> We're going to kick off the show with a review of the NBL's review system, if that I makes like sense. I like it, yeah. In the Let's spotlight, you weren't, you weren't happy with a couple of uh, incidents over the weekend. No, I, I think we should have a look at it. Oh, I love the review system. Mm -hmm. I think it's a great system. So I want to go on record with that first. And I think it's been a revelation for the NBL and I think we need to keep it. I've got a few question marks though. And we'll have a look at this first one with Tom Vodanovic uh, in the Sydney Kings game. And there is no doubt that, and this was at a critical stage of the game. You were out there doing fine work from the sidelines and the Kings were just making a play. I think it was back to five or six or something. And you see Tom, he clearly just slaps Kyle Adam on the wrist. Mm -hmm. Should have been called a foul. The referee missed it. The ball went out of bounds. So they've called it out of bounds and then they've gone and reviewed it. Now, from that review and then, system... And then gone, oh, crap. Yeah, they're what gone. What have we done? And they're talking to each other like, <laughs> oh, my goodness, I can't believe we missed that foul. Are we just going to give it back to them because we should have had a foul? Yep. Bum, bum. You're not allowed to do that. If you, you miss the foul, you can't call a foul. you just got to call who it's off. And it should have been off Kyle Adnam. True or not? Very true. You can see what the referees were trying to do by giving the ball back to them. But but that's not the rule. It's not the rule. No, it's not. So it's wrong. Yeah. Yep. Just straight up wrong. Bad. We need the... Should, uh, well, should they be able to go back and review the foul? Well, a, little a, bit like, different... a little bit like the NRL bunker where they go back and they go, oh, we missed this, we missed this. But that, that's a whole different category, isn't it? it? Like Because right now we're only talking about what they can and can't do yeah. and saying under the rules you can't just make up your own rules because they're the <laughs> rules. That's what we've got the review system. No wonder everyone's confused I'm sitting in the studio saying, oh, no, that's clearly going to be South East Melbourne's ball. Yeah. Bah, bah. Um, another one in the game following that, uh, Scott Machado. Had me even more confused. Scott Machado <laughs> does the same thing. And clearly, he, he probably got bumped, but clearly just throws the ball out of bounds. It slips out of his hands, whatever. And they go to the review and clearly it's going to be off Scott Machado. And they say the same thing. So, And, and you hear Gorge talk to Vaughan Mabry at one stage and say, they've reviewed it and they've just sort of gone old school like you would. And this happens in games. You know that if you've been fouled or something, they've missed the foul, they sort of give it back to you and they're not going to penalise you twice. Mm -hmm. But you can't do that on the review system. Yeah, it doesn't I'd, work, does it? I would love to know what the referees... So I would love to be in the room. And when we're, when we're commentating in the studio, the referees, Scott Butler and, and Billy Mildenhall at stages and all these great refs are in there. I would love to be in there and listen to what they're saying. Well, they just got to swallow their pride. Well, they're really? just going to say, yeah, the ref was wrong, yeah. so we've got no choice and we have to give it to them because they're the rules. How hard is that to do, though, oh, for anyone? <laughs> well, for a ref to say r r r r wrong. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think that's what it was. All right, let's keep things moving with our TCL starting five. Finn Delaney pretty much carried the breakers against Melbourne United. Uh, career high, 33 points, 66% field goal percentage. It's pretty impressive. So good. I love his game. He's got bigger things to come and, uh, you know, his next step is probably to be able to go to Europe and then climb up through Europe um, and give him a, 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 give himself a chance at the summer leagues as well. He's just got a great body type and he's becoming smart. He's got that international experience with the Tall Blacks. Very tough matchup for anyone when he's playing that four spot. But he can defend virtually one through five with that mobility as well and uh, just love his game. And, and he was outstanding and he needed to be with Ty Webster out. The biggest upset of the round, the Adelaide 36ers, yes, boys, getting Your over boys. the... Your boys? Oh, we've heard from you again that you barracked from now. <laughs> You've gone missing for about six weeks. That's all right. Getting over the Wildcats. That was, that was immense. That came out yeah. of nowhere. Well, yeah. I mean, from the fact that Perth had won nine in a row... Yeah. Uh, and they were firing, but that happens sometimes. You win nine in a row, you're on the, the road, so there's a little bit of lull. And then Adelaide then just bring it. And it, even during the game, you're just waiting for Perth to be able to inch their way back. You could feel it. Mm. But with the defence of Sunday Detch uh, on Bryce Cotton, it was a perfect matchup. And Detch was like two for 13 or something, couldn't hit anything. But um, great defence. DJ outstanding. Um, Brandon Paul looked good. And then with Josh Giddy. 
being able to throw the ball around like he does. 13 yeah. assists, um, just incredible. So they're, they're, they're a dark horse for the top four. I don't think they will, but they're going to make a play. I think they're a better chance than Brisbane. If they get Humphreys back in time, there is still, there, they do still have time. They're better than Brisbane. Yeah, okay. Um, I know Director Dave has been wanting to talk about Pinder for quite a while as well. Yes, he um, does. <laughs> <laughs> he get, you won't want to this week. <laughs> 12 points and four blocks, though. Well, oh, he was outstanding. Had four knucklehead plays to go with four outstanding blocks. Best game he's ever played. Don't worry about that. He um, was impressive. My favourite piece of social media commentary was somebody writing, whoever's wearing a Pinder's <laughs> jersey out there, can you please <laughs> stay in <laughs> <laughs> Stay. Sign that bloke. <laughs> Not the Pinder we'd seen before. But he, he, was, he was good. Yeah, he was. He good. was Needs he to was. work on his interviews, but he was good. Uh, Matthew Delavadova. Back, yes. back, and probably had his best outing since he was back. Uh, Ten assists, seven points against the Pels, and also played 34 minutes. So back to full, essentially. Well, I, as well. I think that he had a period he had 24 assists to zero turnovers. It's just unbelievable stuff. When he's been out of the game as long as he has, to be able to come back, and we see uh, Ryan Brockoff back here. It's taken time. As good as you are, it takes time to be able to get back. And um, it's a great sign for the boomers. That's what I'm most excited yeah. about. Um, not so worried about the NBA for Dally right now from a selfish point of view. When you put on the green and gold, we need him for the boomers. He's just that veteran, um, provides that culture and leadership and toughness. And great to see him hit the ground running Dally. Definitely is. Uh, the NBA MVP, Nikola yep. Jokic, probably going to pick it up. He's as certain as what um, Bryce Cotton is, I reckon. Oh, do you right think now. so? I reckon they're about on par. I feel like LeBron James would have something to say about that. But um, Brad Stevens said about Jokic, though, he's one of the most unique players I've ever coached against. He basically doubles as their centre and their point guard, that's, which is true. But that's modern-day basketball mm. now, is you rely so much on some of your bigs with your systems, dribble handoffs, you pops back. Now you've got to make the decision to do it. He's such a good passer, so much poise, that Euro European IQ as well of the way he plays, but unbelievably talented. Hits the threes, he's got the Dirk fadeaways and different things and dribbling and all the rest of it. He's outstanding. Yeah, love watching him play. Uh, he had a triple-double <coughs> against the Celtics. They went down, um, but he had 17, 10 and 11. Speaking of the Celtics, they are building right now. Three wins in a row and three significant wins of substance. Uh, Director Dave just snuck. He was keen to sneak this Celtics one. He just loved, he, he must love them because I'm looking at it and saying, well, you've beaten Minnesota, so you should. You beat mm -hmm. New York, who cares? And uh, you have one good win. So I need to see a little bit more out of them than that. Don't okay, we? fair enough. I mean, they're, they're good, but they're not gonna win the East or anything like that. All right, it's time for our favourite segment of the week, Points Made. Let's bring in Derek Crocker. Derek, hello to you. I've got to ask the Hawks. They've been on a bit of a roller coaster ride recently, but they've got themselves back on track with two straight wins. Will they be there come playoffs? Joe, I don't think so. They had a really big weekend. And how crazy a stat is it that they scored 82 points in each of those three home games? That We've never seen that before. Anyway, back to the point, the Hawks aren't going to make it. I don't think they're the team that we all thought they were earlier in the season. And right now I see three teams competing for that fourth position. Sydney, Illawarra, and Brisbane. And the best team out of those three, Shane, the Brisbane Bullets. Patterson will get back in shape. They'll grab that fourth spot. Book it. Yeah, well, I'm not with you. I don't think Brisbane will make it at all. I think the loss of Vic Law is going to really hurt them. And it's funny how Patterson's already lost weight. He's already in shape. He's done a James Harden. That's what he's done. Looking better already. So he will definitely help them. But I think it's the Sydney Kings. Even though they've been ravaged with injury, I still think they've got enough. No way are Illawarra making it. They're not the team we thought they were. Just too many blank spots in games. They limped yeah. to the line against Cairns. Unimpressive. Man. Guys, what about the gorge factor? Look, he's a great coach. There's no doubt about it. But look, you need horses. You need talent. There are limitations down there. And they've got to get Cam Barstow healthy. I think that will help narrow that gap a little bit. But even with Barstow, I don't think they have enough, Joe. All right, fair enough. Time will tell. I've got to ask you guys, Cam Luke and Andrew Gaze were bickering over the weekend about oh. the interpretation of the unsportsmanlike foul. It was rather amusing. I'll bring you guys in, though. Hammer, what do you think about this? 
amusing. It was doing my head in. I wanted to send one of them to the naughty corner. I tell you, give me a break. But uh, the, the unsportsmanlike foul was brought in from FIBA because they had to stop people fouling in transition. That's what it was for. That's a good rule. We want to stop that. We want to open the game up. But where an adjustment has to be made by the NBL, even if FIBA don't, is we have to allow people to foul at the end of the game. That's part of the game is to send people to the free throw line. And at the moment, it's ridiculous. It's uh, inconsistent with the way it's adjudicated and we need it fixed. Yeah, I agree with you, Shane, especially with the end of game situation. That's not outside the normal course of play to be fouling to try and give your team a chance to win. But now you can see guys sometimes are reluctant. They don't know how to approach a foul in that situation, and that shouldn't be the case. Now, also, I think there needs to be some level of punishment for malice in a foul. Right now, we don't always cover that. And obviously, the unsportsmanlike foul, it's just getting blown too much even in transition. And there's inconsistency in it even after a review. I thought the other night in the game against Illawarra, Harry Froling grabbed the guy from behind. And I was I was almost certain that that was an unsportsmanlike foul. And it got it got rep just a normal foul upon review. What's the deal? Flip of the coin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the guess. Flip a coin. <laughs> All right, let's keep things moving, guys. Gary Trent Jr. had a career night for the Raptors. He had 44 points. He said afterwards that it's the first time in his career that he feels like he's wanted in a team. Derek, how important is it for a player to to feel like that and I guess have the license to go at it offensively? Well, I think his comments about feeling wanted are actually his own personal code for now I'm allowed to shoot as much as possible. Okay, he's had two games already where he's got up a lot of shots. Now, look, He's shooting really well, but I think that's what he's really trying to say. His offensive talents are now being valued, and he's been given the green light. But look here. Let's not get it twisted. He went to prolific prep high. You know where that is, Joe? It's in the Napa Valley, all right? He's he's lived a good life. Don't feel like he's some underdog. And then where did he go to college, Shane? He went to Duke. Let's not go crying tears for this guy like he's never been wanted. He's lived a very good life due to basketball. Well, I read that and I wanted to give him a hug. I felt for him, but I'm glad that he feels loved now. He goes, he's playing for Nick Nurse. I love Nick Nurse. I reckon you'd want to play for him. And what it shows is it's a good trade because when you get an opportunity to be able to bring somebody like him into your program, that's a good fit. Obviously, he's a good fit. Nick Nurse wants to be able to use him. He's able to polish him. He gets more out of him than what he's worth. Uh, Just seems like it's a good situation. And there's no doubt. When you feel the love, you're going to play better basketball, and that really comes down to what role you've got and, as you said, the licence you've got as well. All the love for the Raptors here on the Basketball Show, that's for sure. I'm going to ask you about the culture at Brooklyn now. I want to read this out. Eddie Johnson said, I believe the personal days that Kari is taking are for a close family member or friend, and I, for one, will hold off criticism until it's revealed. But the culture in the Nets locker room will get them beat come playoffs, guaranteed. Hammer, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> well, you're going to throw those guys together that are chasing a championship. When you have a look at Harden, what, and you want to talk oh, culture, come on. You, you talk about Kyrie. Kyrie had to play with LeBron to be able to get a championship. Harden's still trying to create this massive team to be able to be gifted one. And KD, well, he had to go and play with uh, Steph and Clay to be able to get it done. You, you're not wow. getting Tim Duncan. Wow. You're not playing. You, this isn't Tim Duncan. This isn't like the culture of some of these superstars. They've had to combine together to get it. So, of course, they're going to be all over the place. They probably still win, will win it. They should win it. But their culture's all over the place. Amazing how you just attack James Harden at any little chance you get. The question was about Kyrie. Sure, it was a bit inclusive when you're talking about the culture. Harden slides in there a little bit, but you just victimized him. It's not, it has nothing to do with him. Kyrie went away early, earlier in the year, and guess what happened when he came back? He went to work. Brooklyn are the best team in the competition. Right now, Kyrie has built personal leave equity with me. I trust him now to go away handle his business. Some people are suggesting it may because it may be because Ramadan starts this evening. He needed a bit of time to do what he needs to do. I wasn't sure I wasn't sure that he was a Muslim, but if that's the case, Hammer, whatever the reason is, he's got equity with me. When he comes back, he'll be better and they're gonna go on and win the championship. Wow. Him, Durant, and the best player in the league right now, James Harden. Well they should. 
But I think what we're talking about is what's going to happen come playoffs and can you trust these guys to be able to bring it at that point in the season. And uh, that's still going to be proven. They've got the most talent, but I'm not convinced totally just yet. Derek, stick around with us now. We're going in-depth, thanks to 2K, with the NBL Awards. We're not going to talk about the MVP. We all know who that's going to be. Who do you guys have as the most improved at the moment? I've got it down to three guys, Shane, in order of the way it should finish if they continue along the vein that they are now. Kyle Adnam, Jordy Hunter, Jack McBay. All right. Each of those guys have done a really good job. Uh, McVay is probably the least impactful on his team's success. Jordy Hunter's had a, a really, really good year, and he's getting better with each game. But Kyle Adam, no doubt, he has the greatest impact on his team. His numbers are great. He's averaging almost 15 points a game in 25 minutes. He, without a doubt, is the most improved player. Yeah, well, I've got it down to two. And uh, for me, it's Jordy Hunter and the significance that he's been able to play with. And not so much on the statistical side. I'm looking more his impact at the defensive end, the way he plays the pick and roll, all of the little one percenters that he's been able to do, playing significant minutes after really not playing at all last year. For me, he's the most improved. The second player for me is Sam Froling because he was injured last year, only averaged six points a game, up to 10 points a game this year. But he, along the lines of Geordie Hunter, his defensive assignments has been good, starting now, playing a significant role for Gorge and learning so much as well, just a solid piece. So for me, it's down to those two. What about it's the defensive? Great that it, it's great that it's so tight. Sorry, Joe, that it's so tight amongst the number of guys. Like All of those arguments, I believe, are valid ones, and that's just a a real strength of the league that that, that, that that there are that many guys in contention for that award. What about the Defensive Player of the Year, Hammer? Well, there's, there's a few for this, and you could argue a number of cases, but I'm going to go with Sunday Detch. I love his game. He is mm. so tough, so consistent. And I look at him and I'm like, I'm glad I'm not playing against him because he's just uh -huh. he, he continues just to go. He's got great size, good athleticism, but he's smart as well. You've got to have the IQ. You've got to know when you're helping, space gaps, be able to get under and over screens. But he's just relentless. And uh, for me, I think he's the best player, a best defensive player in the competition and somebody that I wouldn't want to be playing against. I really like what Isaac Humphreys was doing earlier in the year. And it's unfortunate that he's, you know, sustain that injury. But I think he'll have enough time to get himself right to still make a claim for DPOY. Now, look, uh, I agree with Sunday Desh. He's an outstanding defender. He's strong. He's quick. He's athletic. And he's more intelligent than probably we give him credit for in sizing up his matchup and taking the, the matchup's best options away from him. The other one I like, obviously, and he's um, it's very sad, but I like what Jack White was doing. Probably the best one-on-one -on -one post defender in the NBL. Um, and look, I think Jock Landale probably doesn't get enough credit for the amount of defensive burden he withstands from game to game now that Jack White is out of the lineup. All right, moving on. Sixth man, d Rock, going to you. This is easy. Kyle Adam. Even though he's overqualified for the award, you know, it'd be like you, Joe, getting best presenter in New South Wales when clearly you're one of the best in the country. Matter of fact, I'm going to say the Southern Hemisphere. Hard and working, hardest working woman in the sports game, baby. Joe Healy. How many gigs does she have, Hammer? I love it, mate. You, like, mate you've just ticked every box, mate, with the political side and yep. uh, we, we already know that. You're right. And Kyle Adam as well. We know that. But I, I didn't give him the most improved because I always felt like Kyle Adam was great over the last few years. I know he's statistically he has and he's taken his game to the next level, but there's no doubt he's the best six man in the competition and plays the yep. most valuable role off the bench of any player in the league. Has the biggest impact for his team and will play crunch minutes as well. And right now, he's going to play above their import in the backcourt just because of how valuable he is as well. So Kyle Adnam for me as well. And, and Joe Healy. Joe, Joe <laughs> I'm not sure if you saw the game yesterday, but Shane is using his status in the NBL to, to uh, recruit coaches to coach his daughter defensive uh, – 
positioning yes. in the post. What I is, am. What's going on? I, what mate, going I, on? I'm do that. Hey, D, if you could play D in the post, I would have used you as well, but I wasn't coming to you because Casper <laughs> Ware is the best I've ever seen and I've booked my appointment and I'm going there and I'm investing in the future. Is he the best post defender you've ever seen? Of a guy? Unbelievable. He gets so low and strong, and he has the perfect timing on when to pull that chair. He's an outstanding defender. Yeah. I'm, I'm going there to learn myself. Don't worry about that. <laughs> Beautiful. Right, last one, guys. This is, I guess it's been thrown in the air a little bit, but rookie of the year, it's almost a case of last one standing. Well, it is a little bit, isn't it? Because I know we were high on Jack White earlier on, and now with DJ going down as well, two terrible injuries, and we've already... You know, shout it out to those guys about keeping their head up. But, um, you know, Josh Giddy, he was going to be right in the mix. Anyways, a superstar he continues to get better. The biggest question I've got with Josh Giddy, and we had Daniel Moldovan on here, we asked him, when are they going to pull the pin on the season? And I still think at some stage they will. As soon as they can't make the playoffs, I think Josh Giddy's out no matter how much he wants to play. He's a star. He's got bigger fish to fry. Giddy has actually exceeded my expectations. I knew what his ability what his abilities were coming into the, the year as a playmaker, but he's better than I thought he was. And if he can continue to knock down that jump shot, the mid range and knock and step out beyond the arc and extend the defense a little bit more. And then he's able, cause he's really slippery with the ball. He's long, he's six, eight, and apparently he's grown Shane. And now he's up to six foot nine in his basketball shoes. So Josh Gideon also in a landslide here. I never thought anybody was really in the hunt, despite what uh, Jack White and Vasilovich had done. I always thought this was Josh Giddy's award, and he's proving it now. Let's hope that he, he can stay healthy, continue to progress, and his team doesn't do well, and they can pull him out, and then he can go to the NBA and be done with it. Why is nobody talking about Yanni Wetzel? I don't understand. I get Josh Giddy is, is killing it as rookie, but... Yanni is having a massive, massive impact. And, and he's definitely getting better. Like, he's mm -hmm. improving week in, week out. There's no doubt about that. He's just not close to Josh Giddy right now with his impact. But as a big, young guy, his future is really exciting because he's exceeded what I thought he would do. And he's done that on the back of Dane Pinot being out. Otherwise, he wouldn't have been getting these minutes. Well, actually, he's a big key to their success, and I think they're the third best team in the competition. Yeah. Um, I think the main thing, Joe, with Yanni is he needs to just develop that consistency. There's a lot of five, six-point games and all of a sudden up to 19. You know, if he could just balance those out, it'd be nice to see him average 13, 14 points a game, seven, eight rebounds a game, and then that's when you really you become a coach's favorite when you can provide that level of consistency. The coach over there next to you knows. <laughs> yes, he does. All right, Derek, great to get your thoughts this week. Thank you so much. We will see you next week. Good on you, Dave. Check you next week, guys. Be. All right, safe to say we don't take ourselves too seriously here on the basketball oh, show. You do? <laughs> do you? <laughs> um, neither does Ty Webster. He's injured, <laughs> injured on the bench against United the other day, eating nachos. Caught by the cameras. I love Ty Webster. It was, He's just like a it, walking gif, right? Yeah. Isn't he? Can you imagine Ty and Corey in year seven and eight? How They, they would have been such the naughtiest they little would kids. Have been, imagine being a teacher. Yeah. Oh. It's like sneaking his little nachos. Oh, he's been busted too, hasn't he? He looked like he was enjoying it too. It was very funny at the time. Probably not a yeah. good look. And can you really, close but... your mouth when you eat? <laughs> <laughs> See your nachos? Come on, Ty. Um, Simon Mitchell has also provided a bit of entertainment. Talk he's, me through this. He's very talkative. You know you guys have been totally owned by Gorgian now. Here we go, guys. As the most obvious first because And because he complains non-stop, you give him everything. Simon Mitchell becoming very animated in this third quarter. Extremely talk. I love it when the coaches are mic'd up. You hear what they say. At one stage, Gorge is at the other end and he's talking to the ref and he's going, are you going to let Gorge do that? Or those words, he's dobbing on Gorge. And then at the end of the game, shook his hand and said, you guys have got big balls. I wanted to jump through the TV and say, that's not what you said before. Don't listen to him, <laughs> Gorge. He was bagging you. That's what I wanted to say. Two very uh, entertaining coaches going out at that game, must admit. Was. I like it. I like yeah, it. it was great. I want personality. Yep, I don't was... want Gorge's sneakers, though. Get rid of the uh, sneakers, Gorge. I Come like on, mate. I like them. I like really? them. Yeah, adds a bit of character. Better than the red. The red <laughs> the red rockets weren't good. I like the red no. ones too, actually. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay.
Um, no, he's struts out in them. It's good. Um, finally, the king of Twitter, the Rex king. Chapman. I love Rex Chapman. He has got the best content. Follow you, you it all could, the time. You could relate to this one specifically, couldn't you? Oh, I certainly could. <laughs> there's so many people on Twitter that there's like just an egg or some alias and whatever and want to spray people and have their opinions. But, you know, you see them in the street and they just wouldn't even say boo to you. So uh, I could relate to this one. I reckon everyone should have to be able to be verified. Some sort of, you know, use your real name. If you're going to say something. Yeah, definitely. Don't you reckon? Definitely. Yeah. Yep, a lot agree of people with that. say no, but it's just my thoughts. We are running Funny. out of time. Shout out to Beck Allen. A Valencia, win. Valencia winning the, win. the Eurobasket Cup, which is fantastic. Yep. She had 16 points in the final, so congratulations, Lots Beck. of Aussies that is... have been through Valencia too. Yes, exactly. Yep. Good stuff. Um, so, no, great work by her. Um, I'm pretty sure that's it, I think. We're Anything done. else? We're done. We're done. Thank you guys for watching. Thank you to TCL Mobile at 2K and News Corp as well. We'll leave you with our top five plays of the week. Scotty Hobson is kicking us off this week. He put his head down en route to the bucket and somehow pulled off the finish. Hobson sees a path to the basket and one play coming up. He looks more dangerous than any player for United tonight, given any sort of space, and he's been able to find a way to get himself to the basket. Next up, Josh Giddy had 13 dimes in the 36ers win over Perth. Captain Daniel Johnson happy to be on the receiving end in what was a big upset. For Daniel Johnson, and why not? DJ's been unbelievable tonight. Well, that combination of Giddy and DJ is just sensational. At three, the Hawks beat the Taipans full court press and Deng Deng made the Snakes pay on the stroke of half time. Oh! Deng Deng, huge jump. Oh my goodness, that's how you end the half. Deng Deng, how's that for a spark? Wow. Yanni Wetzel had the upper hand over Geordie Hunter and the Kings. He swiped it at the defensive end and made sure to finish with a statement. A block with emphasis and then... Oh! oh my! Let's go! <laughs> Getting it done at both ends! Yanni Wetzel! I'm wearing your jersey tomorrow! What a play! That was huge. Oh my God! He blocks his shot hammer then dunks on him! And at number one, Nathan Sobey took advantage of the mismatch with Sam Froling and exploded to the rim. Oh! It was Sobey throw down! Oh my goodness! You can't keep a good man down! You cannot keep a good man down! This is a co-production by News Corp Australia and Closer Sports.